Hello, and welcome to the Powerful Personal Brand Podcast, where my guests and I share tips to help and inspire you to build a great personal brand to increase your visibility and authority. I am your host, Claire Bond, and on today's episode, I am so excited to be joined by Kathleen Booth. Kathleen is an experienced marketing leader who helps startups find success by building high growth marketing systems, strategies, and teams. Named by top rank as one of the 50 top B2B marketing influencers in 2021, she has also the host of the Inbound Success Podcast, which I did um, a little over a year ago, and an avid LinkedIn creator on topics relating to marketing and entrepreneurship. Kathleen, thank you so much for being here. It's so exciting to, to have you on my podcast. <laughs> I know, I'm excited to be here. Thank you for having me, Claire. Yeah. So I, um, one of the things that, because I know you use your personal brand to build your empire. And I'm, I, you know, I know for myself, you learn a lot of things along the, on the, along the way of doing that. Um, good things, bad things, um, all of that sort of stuff. So how has hosting a podcast impacted your personal brand? Oh, it's been huge. I mean, I, I started my podcast five years ago and. Um, I've published more than 250 episodes. Um, and I don't think at the time when I started it, I really knew what I was in for. Um, I, at the time I owned an agency and I was thinking this would just be a great part of my marketing strategy. But actually shortly after that, I sold the agency, but I kept doing the podcast. And it was because the, I think the first thing I recognized was that it was a tremendous door opener. And so there were mm -hmm. people in the marketing world, it is a marketing podcast, uh, that I wanted to get to know who otherwise would have no reason to take my call. But all of a sudden, you know, when you're inviting them to come on as a guest on the podcast, it's a different conversation. And so it opened a lot of doors for me. It helped me build a really robust network of people that are considered marketing thought leaders. I learned a tremendous amount from them. Um, I still to this day learn so much from every podcast guest that I interview. Uh, and it, you know, it put me in front of an audience of, of other marketers. And so it's, it's really been, it's been interesting. You know, it's interesting when you go out into the world to conferences and people say, Oh, I've been listening to your podcast for the last several years and you've never met them before. So it's a wonderful, yeah. Um, it's, it's a wonderful relationship that you build with people who you, you don't necessarily have had to meet, have met in person. Um, you know, it's mm -hmm. a different kind of a relationship. Uh, so yeah, yeah. I definitely have found that I've had some really interesting conversations and, um, sometimes I mean, I've, I have had guests that aren't necessarily in the marketing field, but they utilize their personal brand for their business. And I've, just crazy. Some of the things that I've learned. Um, do you find that, that all of a sudden you're just like, wow, I love just learned so much. And I'm so excited about that conversation that I just had. Oh, every time. And, and uh, in fact, anybody who listens with any degree of regularity to my podcast will have heard me say over and over that I would continue to do it. Even if nobody listened, thank God people mm. do, but I, it's like getting a master uh, a master's in marketing, you know, every, I mm -hmm. get to pick the people I talk to. And very often I do pick people based on things I'm trying to learn selfishly for, for myself. You know, like yeah. if I'm, if I want to know more about, I, I just talked to somebody the other day who I'm going to interview in the next few weeks, who is an expert in Google analytics four, which is coming. They're going to deprecate Google analytics three. And I was like, I don't know enough about this. So yes, let's do this interview. And I'll get, I always assume that if, that if I'm learning something, that there's a whole cadre of people out there that are also learning something. Yeah. I mean, that's like one of the things when, when um, like we talk with clients, a lot of times when people are stuck, like, who's my ideal audience? And they're just so fixated on what type of information to share. A lot of times the information that we also would, would benefit from and really like us, our ideal client are often, I find, similar to us. Do you find that? Like when you're kind of taking on a a client. I do. And in fact, what's been interesting for me about my journey with this, this whole personal branding thing is that I think in, in, for many years, I felt such imposter syndrome because you always feel like you have to be the world's best expert in whatever it is you're talking about in order to put yourself out there and in order to build a brand around something, you know, because when you look at other people who have these strong personal brands, we make a lot of assumptions that they're, they're the top expert in that thing. And, I finally right. realized that, that at least for me, what my brand is more about, it, it's, it's, it's less about me positioning myself as an expert in something. And it, and I think mm -hmm. of it as inviting people to learn alongside me. 
Um, Mm -hmm. and, and that came actually from feedback I got from someone who once worked for me. I I got a LinkedIn recommendation from this person who was a direct report. And she said, Kathleen loves to learn and really likes to bring people alongside her as she does that. And I was like, huh, that's actually really true. I never realized that about myself until someone else said it. And, and that's, so that's how I think of it. It's like uh, very often we'll do podcasts on topics I know nothing about. And I post things on LinkedIn about something that I know very little about. It might be a question. It might be, I just had this realization today. And so, um, you know, for me, that's what it's about. It's we're all in this together. We're all learning and trying to get better. And so I just feel like the more I can share and bring people along on the journey, the more I'll get back in the end as well. Yeah. Well, I guess like what I'm hearing is kind of like authenticity and just, you know, kind of being inquisitive and just the, the one thing that, that really struck me with that, I guess, is because I literally had a exact kind of imposter syndrome moment where I was talking to my husband and I'm like, do you ever feel like you feel like you feel like a kid? Like you feel <laughs> like, like you're like, what am I doing here? Or how did I get here? Or I can't believe that I'm here right now. And and he goes, you mean imposter syndrome? And I'm like, oh, that's what it is. Like I never, yeah. sometimes it takes somebody else kind of putting that um, outside spin on it. But I think that a lot of people are, I mean, so many people are held back by that. They're held back by um, self-doubt, imposter syndrome. So they won't actually say like, I don't know this. I'm going to put this question out there. Can someone provide me this information? Because I feel like it somehow makes you look weaker. I feel, yeah. and I don't think that it does at all. We're not experts, and I think being truthful about that and and being thankful when someone that is an expert gives you their information, you're like, thank you so much. Well, and I mean, look, we all have to recognize that nobody's perfect. Even the people who genuinely are the world's top experts and things still get things wrong sometimes. And if you mm-hmm. go into it thinking you have to always be right, or you have to always know more than everybody else, you are setting yourself up for massive disappointment and failure. Um, the way I kind of liken this to something in, in B2B marketing, which uh, marketers call building in public. And the concept mm-hmm. behind that is, um, is you'll see a lot of like startup founders do this where they'll say, Hey, mm-hmm. I'm starting a company and they might not even have a product yet, but they start posting on Twitter and posting on LinkedIn and writing blogs. Like, opening up the kimono and saying, here's where I am. I'm thinking I'm going to do this, or I'm struggling right now with hiring. And they invite, they invite people in to see how the sausage is made. And that has actually proven to be a very, very successful way to, to do marketing before you have a product. So that by the time you have a product to sell, you already have an audience, you already have a tremendously loyal following and people Mm -hmm. learn a lot from seeing that, seeing you go through that process. And so to me, my brand is, is, like building in public, but instead of building a product or a business, I'm, I'm building myself as a marketer. And it's like, how do I invite people in to see how the sausage is being made in my own yeah. you know, brain, I guess. <laughs> I had a, um, a coach, business coach, she said taking imperfect action. That was her kind of way of saying that. It's, it's, it's very similar to that. So I love that you are talking about that because I feel a lot of times with, with clients that we have, they have a lot. Um, they're so impressed by, um, they may or not have big ears, <laughs> impressed by the things that they've done that when you kind of go, okay, well, we need to <clears throat> peel back the layers of what you've done and what is the information that you're going to share. And you are going to be uncomfortable maybe learning this on camera business um, and some of these other things that you now need to do. And I think what was it hard for you to ins- essentially, you know, pull back the screen and, and take imperfect action? Like, do- was it really hard for you to do that and basically just say, I don't know everything? And if so, what tips would you have for others that struggle with it? I mean, it's certainly scary, right? You, you know, you, you, you write things down, like, and I post a lot to LinkedIn. So I would say my personal brand really comes from two places. One is the podcast and the other is my LinkedIn presence, um, where I, a few years back, I set a goal for myself to post five days a week to LinkedIn, basically Monday through Friday. And I did that for probably two years. Now it's a little bit more off and on, but I, it built me a following of something like 16,000 people on that platform. Mm-hmm. And you know, it's scary. You write out these posts and you think, okay, I'm going to hit send. What if somebody disagrees? Or what if I'm exposing that I really don't know what I'm talking about? I would say 99% of the time, 
it's not that way. I, I, I have wonderful mm -hmm. discussions with people, great back and forths, people who respectfully challenge or question what I've said, but it, you know, I learn more, they learn more. We engage in an interesting discussion. It's only every now and then that, you know, somebody comes back with something that's combative and, mm -hmm. you know, it stinks when it happens, but this is also life. Like anything you do in life, you, you open yourself up to that potential. Um, and, and I think that what I always tell people to remember is that you don't have to be the smartest person. Like think of it as you're in a room of a hundred people and there might be 10 or 20 or even 30 or 40 people who are smarter than you, but there's also 40, 50 or 60 people who are not as smart as you about the particular topic that you're talking about or don't know as much about it. I don't want to say smarter or not smart, but like, you know, that, that, you know, more than them. And yeah. so if that's the case, you have something to share with them. You have something to give. And I think I just actually posted something about this on LinkedIn today about the best <laughs> personal brands are not about ego. They're about having a give first mentality and recognizing yes. that when you find that nexus of the thing you're passionate about, the thing you believe in and the thing you have experience with. And, and when you then take that and you educate, inspire or entertain around it, you're delivering value. And that's what personal branding is really about. It's about delivering value. And in by delivering value, you build trust, you build an emotional connection, you build a relationship and that eventually someday will come back to benefit you in some way, shape or form. Yeah. I think the important thing there is also someday. A lot of times people want that immediate ROI. Um, and, you know, just listening to what you said, you said five years working on your podcast and to, and posting on LinkedIn, like how consistently you were, so you were posting five days a week. You said you started that three years ago. I think it was like, three years that, ago. So yeah. It's like, yeah, many years. I think that's one of the biggest takeaways that I want people to hear. What are you saying is that it takes time. It takes time. You know, anytime you kind of say, okay, I am seeing Kathleen right now and I'm, I'm envious of her success or whatever it is. You're like, well, do you, do you know all of the hard work that you, that took you, you know, that you took to get here? And I think that's what some people don't see. They want, they are like, okay, well, I have this expertise. I've done these things, but you're like, but you have no personal brand. You don't have an audience. You don't have a, you know, a top podcast. You don't have all of these things. So it takes time. Yeah. You have to earn trust you, and it's consistency. Yeah. And, um, and it's look at the end of the day, you, you shouldn't be building a personal brand. If what you're looking for is immediate bang for the buck, you're not going to get it. Um, you mm -hmm. should be doing it because you believe it's the way that, that you, you fundamentally believe that it's, it's the DNA of how you should do business today. Right. Um, mm -hmm. and I, this is something I strongly believe in, like in the last three years, particularly the world has changed dramatically. And, you know, before 2020, uh, we lived in a world where if somebody needed something, they might go to Google and type in a question or search for something and try to find a solution. But, you know, in the last few years, these, these online communities have sprung up and grown more than ever. And it's not that they weren't there before, but it's that we had, we, we all of a sudden were forced to really engage in them. And the result of that has been now when you need something like as a CMO, when I need new software for my team for some particular application, I don't go to Google and try to figure out what the best like chatbot software is, for example, I go to my community of peers that's in Slack or in LinkedIn or wherever my community is. And I say, Hey, what are you guys using? And so business today is about getting at bats in those walled gardens. And who's giving you the at bat? Who are the people that are saying you should talk to this company? They're either very happy customers of that company mm -hmm. or they're people who have some sort of other emotional connection with that brand. Um, you know, and so those other people who are not customers, how do you build that connection? Well, one of the best ways you can do it is through personal branding, believe it or not, like company marketing today is very much about personal branding because no company is ever going to build the level of trust with a person that another person will. And yeah. when I build a relationship with my followers, my listeners of my podcast, that relationship has a halo effect on whatever company or brand I'm involved with. And so it's the long game. It is simply 
It is simply how business is done today. And so you mm-hmm. have to believe in that. You have to invest in it much like you would anything else in business um, and, and expect that it's a, it's table stakes. Yeah. I, I like that. Cause I, I, we do, we have corporate clients and sometimes we're kind of fighting with them to do it differently. And I, I was speaking with, with someone about this and I said, basically when you start, when you w- jumped into business um, right out of college, you were dealing with, you know, baby boomers and people that were maybe older than that. And they, they had an idea of what marketing was. And because who are you marketing to? You were marketing to a different age group. You may not have been marketing to yourself at a, as 21 years old, but you know, now the tables have turned for some people. You're, tar- you're targeting your age group. For some, for some people, you're targeting lower than your age group and you have to do things differently. You can't do things the way that you, they did when they when you started. And I literally said that to one of our corporate clients. When, you know, he's a, he's a co-founder of one of these companies. And I'm just like, this is it. You know, you have to think about what it you know what it is that you're doing. And I said, you know, and I said something about how like you can't market like a baby boomer or an older Gen Xer. And he goes like, Oh no, am I an older Gen Xer? <laughs> <laughs> well, even even I would say for older demographics, here's something super revealing. So in my podcast, as I mentioned, I've done 250 plus episodes. And at the end of every single episode, I ask two questions, the same two questions every time. And one of those is I always hear from marketers that it's very overwhelming to try and keep up with all the changes that are happening in the world of digital marketing, particularly. So how do you personally stay up to date and keep yourself educated? In the first year or two that I did the podcast, the answers that I got were almost always, I read this newsletter or I like that blog or, um, you know, I, I go to this website to stay up to date or I watch these videos. In the last two years, it has almost uniformly been, I rely on my community of peers. I rely on my connections on LinkedIn or I go into pavilion and I, and I rely on my network there. So what's happened is marketing, you know, digital marketing has enabled us to be prolific and in getting marketing messages out. And it's the landscape is very cluttered. So people these days are overwhelmed with information online. Like 10 years ago, you could, you were reading blogs because blogs were not that common and it was a novelty. Mm. And you could learn a lot. Today, there's a million blogs on every topic. So how do you know which one to listen to or read rather? And so what's happening is that people are turning to their communities to weed out the noise for them and to, to do the work for them effectively. And if you think about it, it's incredibly smart and efficient. Like I don't need to read 10 blogs and 15 newsletters a day. I can go into my communities and there's usually a certain channel where everybody's sharing the latest news. And I have you know, 50 other top CMOs curating news for me. It's, Mm -hmm. it's so much better, but because of that, what that means is that we're no longer learning from these third party websites and these third party marketing materials. We're learning from other people. And that's why personal branding is so important. If you Mm -hmm. can establish a brand as the person everyone else is learning from, then you're effectively the same as what a website was five years ago. You know what I mean? It's just, you happen to be taking yeah. human form. I think also people will do their research, even if, I mean, I know that I've gone in and said, Hey, who would you guys recommend for, you know, building out a new landing page or doing some of these things? But I will always, I, I go in my communities and, and I get some names, but I always do some Google research because I want to find out what other people think too. I don't know. That just could be me. No, it, I don't just take one source. So I think that ultimately your online presence is going to be great. It, it's great to be talked about, but your online presence, your website, all your social medias, those are still going to be important because I know that a lot of people will still do their, their, you know, research as I do. Yeah. Do you're you right. You're research? right. <laughs> but there's a subtle difference in, in what's happened. Okay. So what I'm seeing is, yes, people still do research, but whereas before they started with that Google search, now yeah. what's happening, and they had to do all the work of figuring out, like, is this company illegitimate? Should I even be, you know, mm-hmm. let me read all the reviews. Now we're going to our communities. We're getting, you know, our short list, if you will, of three to five providers. And instead of then going to Google and randomly saying, what's the best chatbot software, we're typing in drift intercom Mm -hmm. because these are the names we've been given so it's branded search instead of 
uh, you know, sort of long tail search. And mm-hmm. what's amazing about that is with long tail search, Google is, is increasingly moving in the direction of, of no click answers, meaning it's going to give you the answer on the search engine results page. So websites mm-hmm. are getting fewer click throughs. But if somebody mm-hmm. goes and does a branded search and puts in a company name, they're always going to click through to the website. And so that's why mm-hmm. this formula is such magic because what you want is you want to be the name that's mentioned. So then somebody does go to Google, type your company name in. They're still going to go to your company website and figure out if there's there there and if you if you can deliver what they need and that's where the stuff you're talking about is so valuable because it's the legitimizer Mm -hmm. it's the thing that's going to tip you over the other two to three companies that got mentioned um so you do still need to have a powerful web presence but the most powerful web presences are the ones that also have really good word of mouth fueling their Mm -hmm. traffic it's interesting because, you know, we're talking, you're talking about how you, you know, you learn things along the way. So I'm just going to be very honest. I just learned something because <laughs> I'm always wondering, I, we don't put out there that Claire Bond group, really. Uh, we're not putting that name out there all the time in, in, in advertising Claire Bond group, Claire Bond group. Uh, most everyone comes to us organically, but Claire Bond group has a ton of search volume. And I'm like, where is this coming from? <laughs> I think you just told me. Yeah, it's exactly that. It's it's good word of mouth. And it it could be from your personal brand. It could be Mm -hmm. from happy customers. But like if you're the name that's getting mentioned in those communities, then people are going to go and they're just going to type your company name in and land on your website. And assuming Mm -hmm. that your website follows through on their expectations of what they think they're going to see then that's mm-hmm. how you start to win business and you you, you get yeah. the phone calls and, and the contact yeah. us submissions. Right. It's so interesting because I've always been like, I don't like sometimes we've had people say, oh, I heard about you in a Wharton chat room and I'm like, Wharton, I didn't go to Wharton. Who's talking about me? And yeah, I guess it's just that. I mean, you, you don't really, I, I don't really extrapolate that because I do that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm well, always like l- searching my groups, you know, women's groups that I belong to and things like that. And I, and I'm like, I just kind of haven't thought about the other, the turn, the, you know, the alternative of that. And people are talking about me. Yeah. And I think this is why, like, today, if I'm, you know, designing a website, or if I have a team that's designing a website, one of the things that I absolutely require is that every forum on that website have a field, which is how did you hear about us? And that field Mm -hmm. is required to be completed. And it's open text, not a drop down, because you will learn so much about like, you know, Jerry from blah, 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 told me I should call you or um, I was in a meeting with my executive team and somebody mentioned you. It's That's the sort mm-hmm. of thing that no attribution software is going to be able to tell you. And yeah. you have no visibility into through a Google alert or any other sort of, you know, alerting system. But, but it mm-hmm. says volumes about the, how your word of mouth is spreading. Yeah. I love that. I'm, I'm going to, yeah, go make sure I do have a drop down. And sometimes I'm like, Google search. Why didn't they tell me what they meant? Okay. Done. Making it happen now. <laughs> yeah, if you have a drop down, then then you don't allow people it. the opportunity to tell you all the like they might not say, I heard you on the Inbound Success podcast, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That I need to do that. Yeah, because they just hit podcast. I don't know which one. Exactly. <laughs> okay. I like that. Sometimes do you, I do find that sometimes when you leave things open ended, you don't always get the best result, but hopefully well, you get sure there will be some people who won't fill it out. I mean, this is why you have to make yeah. it required. And somebody might just type in mm-hmm. ABC one, two, three. You can't help that, um, you yeah. know, and but that's fine. But I have found that the vast majority of cases, people do fill it out and they get pretty damn specific and you learn a ton yeah. from it. Well, also, I mean, if, if they just put like you, you said, like the numbers and things like that, you're like, maybe this is not my ideal client. Exactly. <laughs> maybe they will not have a consultation. Exactly. Because <laughs> my ideal client is definitely going to fill it out and know what they um, what they what they want. So, yeah. Based on all of this, you said so much great information. I mean, I know I've learned some things, but I would love to have like three tips about just kind of really building your online presence because you have so much marketing knowledge and everything. Really, what what are three things that someone can do to really build their online presence? Yeah, I think the the very first thing is pick one channel to start. Because if you bite off more than you can chew, you're not going to follow through with it, right? So mm. for me, I mean, putting the podcast aside, for me, it's really been LinkedIn. Um, I chose to make that my kind of home on the internet. And 
really conquer that before allowing myself to go anywhere else. And I'll never forget when Clubhouse came out, I had so many people saying like, are you going to go on Clubhouse? Should I be on Clubhouse? And I was like, I'm not doing anything there. Like if, if something lands in my lap, fine, but I have no Clubhouse strategy. I'm putting zero effort into it because I need to focus on really nailing LinkedIn before I allow myself to fall victim to this shiny penny syndrome. Yeah. Um, so that's number one is to stay focused on one channel first. Second is then to really figure out what your, I'm going to call it what your theme is. Like if you're going to build a brand, it's, that's about focus and about being known for something. Um, and for me, it's startup marketing, right? That's the, the theme that underlies everything that I talk about and post about. If you're just randomly posting about a million different things, it becomes hard for any one person to choose to follow you consistently because Maybe the topic you post Monday is relevant, but the one Tuesday isn't. So if you have a theme, people that are interested in that theme are going to stick with you. And that's how you build an audience and a brand. So it's focus on a channel, focus on a theme. And then the third thing is you got to be consistent. Um, and unfortunately, this is it's just like what we all know about exercise. This is not rocket science. We all know what we should be doing, just like I know that I should be doing cardio and weights X numbers of times a week. But unless you're consistent and you follow through, you are not going to see results. Unfortunately, if there was a magic pill that we could all take to lose 10 pounds or to build a personal brand, somebody would be out there selling it, but it doesn't exist. Yeah. So, so focus, uh, theme and consistency would be my three tips. I like that. Um, it's so interesting that you brought up um, Clubhouse. I still have it on my phone. I joined and I just, I was like, I can't. Yeah. Not one more thing. It's one more thing. But I think there's a real big FOMO um, because people want to jump in on that thing, right? Yeah. The first people that jumped into TikTok now have millions of followers. The first people that jumped into YouTube. The first people that realized that LinkedIn was this really open space before they really started nailing things down, probably in the last three years to make that kind of, um, trajectory hard, um, and increase followers and everything. So I think there's this thing of like, I have to do this thing because I'm late to the game on every other platform. I agree. I think there's definitely that feeling, but, but I would challenge that by saying that I actually think that 90 plus percent of the people that are successful on different platforms out there are not the ones that join first. You know, there can mm. be a first mover advantage. Um, but that doesn't just getting on there first isn't enough. Like you really have to go yeah. all in. You have to figure it out. And again, that's about the focus, right? That's why I'm saying like pick one channel. If that channel is a brand new channel, do it, go for it. Great. Be, be the most all in on whatever the next clubhouse is, but don't think you're going to be able to do clubhouse and TikTok and LinkedIn all well, unless you already are crushing two of those three platforms. You know what I mean? Like you can't yeah. do three at once. You can't be building on three at once. You have to choose one and, but you and by yourself. If yeah. You have a team then. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Right. But even then, even yeah, then yeah. with, cause I've led teams and it's the same thing. You got to start somewhere and you got to do well in that mm -hmm. first place and show results to get momentum. And then you can take what you learn being successful in that one platform and bring it somewhere else. Um, you know, but 90 I, I plus to, percent I, oh. of the people that are successful on these platforms, a lot of them have started recently. Like LinkedIn is a great example. I started okay. three years ago. LinkedIn has been around forever and mm -hmm. I'm still able to build a following of, you know, almost 16,000 people. Who am I? You know, I was nobody. I'm yeah. still nobody. Yeah. <laughs> I just happen to yeah. post consistently. Well, but, but I want to ask you, um, cause this, this came up in a different conversation, um, that someone was like, Oh, I post a lot and my posts are viral. And, and I did a little bit of research. And I'm like, not really. And you're just sharing other people's posts. So do you think there's a kind of like a, a strategy or a certain percentage of like your own content you should be sharing? curated content you should be sharing? Like, what is, do you have any kind of feedback on that based on your experience on LinkedIn? Yeah. Well, I mean, I'll, I can be specific to LinkedIn because that's the platform I know the best. Um, and this is a really interesting topic that I have strong feelings about because I have worked at companies where I've, I've had CEOs say, you know, Hey, I've had people reach out to me and tell me that you're not posting enough about the company. And, mm. and I have to be like, nobody's going to follow me if I only post about this company. Like you have to earn the right to post about your company. So for me, it's like 80 plus, sometimes 90 plus percent is not company related 
stuff. It's, it's not reposting anybody else's content. And, and most platforms like LinkedIn doesn't like when you repost other posts, it likes original mm-hmm. posts that don't right. take you off platform. And so, you know, I, that's the building in public thing. So you'll see a lot of my posts are the things that I'm working on or thinking about. And then every now and then I, I will slip in something that has to do with the company that I work with. And the thing is, when I do that, it gets attention because I don't do it too often. And I don't, mm-hmm. I don't abuse the, the privilege of putting my, you know, company content in front of the people that follow me. So I've seen when I do do it, that we get contact us submissions on the company site that say things like, because we ask, how'd you hear about us? They'll say Kathleen's LinkedIn post. So I can see that my posts re- result in actual like pipeline and opportunities for the company, but that only happens because I don't abuse that privilege. Very interesting. So I, I call those kind of like about what you're talking about, posting about your company. I call those yay me posts. It's it's one of those things where, where pe- people usually won't comment. They're just kind of like, yay you like, yeah. what do I do with this? Yeah. You're not kind of, you're not, there's no real feedback you can give. It's not, it's yeah. It's, it's like, an ad. like a one, it's a statement, right? So a statement doesn't usually require anyone to do anything in return. So yeah. Yeah. And, or an ad. I like that. I have so many good tips that, that I have definitely learned. And I definitely know um, that the audience has probably hopefully written some stuff down. Um, so Kathleen, please tell people where they can find out uh, more about you, connect with you. Sure. So I have a website that is Kathleen-Booth.com. But um, you can also, of course, find me on LinkedIn. Um, and I accept every connection request there. I, I love connecting with new people. So shoot me a note and let me know you heard uh, about me here on Claire's podcast. And then you're also welcome to check out the Inbound Success podcast. And you can start with Claire's episode because that was a really good one on personal branding. I have another question for you. Oh, so many questions for you. Um <laughs> You accept all um, connections. I find I don't do that because I get so many sales pitches. Do you weed out the ones? I get a ton of sales pitches and I just sort of ignore them. Um, Okay. I, the only time I won't accept a connection request is if it's, if it looks like it's a bot (laughs) or, you know, and every now and then I'll, I'll like un friend, or I don't even know what the term is unconnect with somebody if they're really persistently spamming me. But, yeah, yeah, I mean, unfortunately, it's the reality of LinkedIn today. There's a lot of DM spam, but I just oh, I figured so out much. a way to ignore it. Okay, good. Yeah, I, I, that is one of the things that I don't like, and I've definitely kind of you know disconnected with people that I'm like, you just leave me alone. Please. Yeah, <laughs> no, I don't want your thing. Yeah. <laughs> leave me alone. Maybe it was interesting, but now it's not because you. Yeah, when it's the, the fifth you time you're it. trying to reach out to me and you're like, I don't want to be a bother, uh, but you are. You are. Yeah. <laughs> Oh my God. Thank you so much, Kathleen, for being here. And thank you for listening and watching. And I will see you in the next episode. Bye.